Anyway, I think there are churches that have 10,000 people on television that don't have a better sound than you gave us today. And usually they've got huge, big plastic enclosures for the drummers and all that stuff. But thank you with minimum equipment. What a magnificent... Don't you think, folks? Yes. It's terrific. It's a little beautiful statement of the kingdom, actually, that a ragtag, bobtail mob like us have such tremendous ministry given to us with music. And uh, I just thank the Lord for that. Today's um, topic, I must admit I usually love preparing for, um, for teaching, it's part of the love of my life and part of the calling that uh, I believe God's placed on my life, but when I looked at what the reading was for today from the Gospels, I, I really struggled with Christmas and uh, that's what we're in the edge of, only a few weeks off. And uh, the heading in the lectionary is um, Christ the King. Have I got this turned on? Or did I not turn it on? Yeah, it is on. Good. Uh, the heading for today in the lectionary is Christ the King. That sounds all right. But to have the, um, the awful time of, uh, of what was quite even in the Roman culture illegal, I think Glenna had a Bible teacher at Bible college that had a special lecture where he laid out what 24 Roman laws that were broken in the way in which Jesus' trial was carried out, something like that. Um, but I thought, how do you take that gruesome story of the, the death of, of Jesus and his unfair trial and, and torture and crucifixion, how do you take that as the introduction? Uh, to uh, the beginning of, of Christmas. So I struggled with it, to be honest. I found it one of the hardest preparations. But then the thing came together. Let me read you a poem from Steve Turner, not the Australian Steve Turner, some of us know, but a British Steve Turner, probably a guy that's written more biographies of rock and roll singers than any other author I know. A uh, great poet and a great biographer. And this is one of his poems from many years ago. Christmas is really for children, especially for children who like animals, stables, stars, babies wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then there are wise men, kings in fine, beautiful robes, humble shepherds, and a hint of rich perfume. Easter is not really for children. Unless accompanied by a cream-filled egg, because it has whips, blood, nails, a spear, allegations of body snatching, and it involves politics. God and the sins of the world. It's not good for people of a nervous disposition. They would be better to think of rabbits, chickens, and the first snow drops of spring. Or they do better to wait for a return of Christmas without asking too many questions about what Jesus did when he grew up and whether there's any connection. I think that's a beautiful introduction to looking at Christ the King, introduction to Christmas, starting with the end of the story instead of the beginning. Now, I don't know if it's a sexist uh, piece of mythology, but I always got told that if there's a saucy novel that women read the last chapter first before they start at the beginning. Is that true, ladies? Yes. It is? I, I never want to do that. I want to find out what happened at the end. But there's one sense in which, unfortunately, Christmas has become the dominant cultural factor. And of course, I'm increasingly alienated, not, not by Christmas itself, but I'm increasingly alienated by that jolly little fat man uh, and now the extraordinary uh, politically correct stupidity of the little fat woman to have Mrs Christmas uh, which further completely destroys what it's about at least um, Sinterklaas to use the Dutch 
name was about a genuine, as far as we can tell, a genuine uh, many centuries ago leader of the church who had a wonderful reputation, who was generous and caring for others. And uh, the giving of gifts and all the rest comes from a little piece of church history. And now they've even wrecked that. They've taken Jesus right out of the picture. And uh, I don't know how long it is since the brilliant Meyer presentation in the shop window front have really had anything to say about what Christmas is really all about. But today as we enter into this Christmas season, the topic is Christ the King. Now if we were to go through this in great detail, if you're a Bible teacher or a scholar, uh, it's wonderfully detailed stuff we have in John's Gospel about the trial of Jesus and about the way in which one of the few figures remembered in European history, um, the man who took the trial, uh, Pontius Pilate. It's funny, isn't it? Even our great Apostles' Creed says, you know, I believe in, and Pontius Pilate ends up with his name in the Apostles' Creed, as does Mary. Uh, it's strange, Jesus, Mary, the disciples, an unfaithful member of the team that undermined it, a man called Judas, and Pontius Pilate, who we look on as a coward, but who probably was caught politically uh, quite terribly. I don't think we're quite fair on him. He was struggling with the fact that if they had any brawls under his jurisdiction, he would lose his job, his pay packet, his fine style of living. And I don't know how many politicians or even prime ministers would have done anything different to what he did if they hadn't have really believed Jesus was Christ the King. And it's kind of funny, if we had time to go through it, we can show that he played some real games with the Jewish people as the debate came as to whether Jesus ought to be seen as a a political danger to the Roman Empire. Obviously Rome didn't really think so because they didn't round up all his mates and you know if ever there's a revolutionary and you've got a powerful group like the Romans were you don't just pick up the guy that's the revolutionary in charge you pick up all his mates as well isn't that right? They didn't do that. So you kind of get the impression that while he conceded a point because he didn't know how else to get out of it, he really didn't see Jesus as the political danger that he looked like he could be. He was certainly dangerous in that there were likely to be fanatics who would gather around the situation. And let's face it, today, as, as was prayed earlier, we face the fact that you're going to get two groups of people out protesting today and uh, both of them tragically will miss the point. One because they will be trying to pretend that they're presenting a Judeo-Christian view against Islam when the way they'll behave won't be the way Jesus would tell us to behave at all. And the other mob will try and say it's about race when it isn't, it's about religion. And the desperate attempts of politicians in the interest of multiculturalism to screw that whole thing up on television day after day after day quite gets up my nose because it is about religion. The debate as to whether it has roots in the Quran I don't want to even get into today. But certainly it's about religion because the people doing it come from all sorts of races. Uh, one of the tragedies in the last couple of weeks is dealing in an African situation where many of the uh, the radicals there, the Islamic radicals there, are actually black, not white at all, nor Middle Eastern. So it's not a race question at all. So the other mob will be wrong today too. And unfortunately what comes out of it certainly won't be in line with what we would understand if we took Jesus seriously. So I want to ask some simple questions out of this today. 
The first question is what kind of king are we talking about? If this is the day when we see Jesus as king, and that's central to his court case, are you the king of the Jews? Says the man in charge of the case. And you get different translations of that, but you heard that read to us today. Somebody else told you this, or is this your opinion, or whatever. And Jesus plays an enigmatic bit of a game without, without giving a full answer to it. And of course, in the end, they put up on his cross. This was the king of the Jews. To which the Jews then object by saying it should say, he said he was the king of the Jews. What kind of king? And then I want to ask what kind of kingdom? I want to say what kind of subjects of this kind of kingdom are we meant to be? And finally, as he's asked in frustration in the court case, when Jesus speaks of truth, the man in charge says, well, what is truth? I mean, if that isn't contemporary for us today, what is truth? You know, who's right? And I often listen to early hours of the morning to different debates on the ABC. I noticed one the other day where the big debate was all about whether religion was dangerous because it proposed truth and that's always dangerous and there isn't actually a truth we can say is the truth and all that stuff they were going with, on with in the ABC. So that's the fourth question. First question, what kind of king was Jesus? Well, I don't object to a nice motorcycle. Mine's sitting in the shed, not exactly rusting, but because I'm not allowed to ride it at present, I sort of sook about it and have a look at it every now and again. Then it wants to know why I don't keep firing up the motor. Well, maybe she's not a male mad motorcyclist because starting up the motor would just make me sook more. And I want to say to you folks, this is a Jesus who just before his trial comes in as the king into the town, remember? And if I was used biker language, he came in on a scooter, not a Harley Davidson. <laughs> That's one to think about, isn't it? He came in on a donkey, not on a stallion, as a king would normally do. He would have been like a bloke that came in on a scooter not on a powerful Harley Davidson. This was a king who had a crown. The crown wasn't made out of gold with encrustings of jewels. He had a crown. It was a crown of thorns. What kind of king was this? Well, he's a king that when you listen to what he said and watch what he did, defies all traditions. He defied the tradition of the Jews he defied the tradition of the Romans. He defies both the secular and religious alternative kingdoms. He's the king who defies the ways of this world. Rather than going from left to right to one extreme or the other, he's alternative. This is a king who spoke of a father who we traditionally have thought of as God. And this is not meant to be a, an attack against uh, sincere people who are Islamic, but virtually all of these terrible slaughters that have gone on in the last, I don't know what, 20 odd years, there's been a little phrase shouted out uh, in the Middle Eastern language saying God is great. That's been what's been shouted out as people have been beheaded, as innocent women and children have been slaughtered. And for at least those who have done this, I agree with what one of the ABC guys said the other day. He said these people are not mad. Check them out. As a psychiatrist, they are not mentally mad. They are a people that has been taught to believe something about God 
and something about how you get to heaven. And don't forget, in defiance of what we are taught by Jesus during the Crusades, admittedly to try and defend the Christian religious places from invasion by the Islamic forces, but nevertheless, the Christians went out there and many young men enlisted to go out and fight the Islamic forces because they were promised that they would get to heaven if they did. Isn't that interesting? They weren't mad either. They were wrong. They were intellectually wrong, they were morally wrong, but they weren't mad. They were people being consistent with what they had come to believe that they had been taught whether by the wrong kind of priests or the wrong kind of imams. Do you get me? And I think they were right in the ABC when they said that the other day. These people are not mad. Wicked, yes. Deluded, yes. Wrong, yes. But they're people that are being consistent with what they've been taught and come to believe. And that is that their God requires them to defend his honour by knocking out those who were the infidels. And unfortunately, there have been times in the history of the church when we have followed the wrong teachings and not followed this kind of king that we remember this Christmas, but a false king created by Islam and created by the church. Because this king described to us what the ultimate God is like. He said, do you want to know what the Father is like, what God is like, because they asked him, he said, how come you don't know? You've been with me for several years. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you want to know what God's like, with respect, don't read the Quran, read the Gospels. Because what God is like is what Jesus was like. And frankly, from my biker mates in a clubhouse to a pub, to homeless people. I know people that hate the church, hate Christians. And I don't really know, I, I doubt I've ever met anybody that hated Jesus. Met a few that think he was a bit of a wimp and should have got up there and fought for himself, but I don't know of anybody I've actually met in my lifetime that hated Jesus. The church, yes. Because this king, Christ the king, spoke of the divine king's father and said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father, because this king was God come in human flesh. This is the king of kings. Appropriate that we had a reading from the book of Revelation, which is the final great statement that the father even in the book of Revelation gives his own son the name which is above every other name so that every knee shall bow to him. And finally, this is a king who doesn't choose for his army a bunch of killers but a motley crew of all sorts. He chooses a St. Paul that was an academic with brilliant education and knowledge of several languages, literary ability, historical ability, and he chooses a bunch of fishermen. And he chooses, although we often speak as though carpenters were kind of the working class down the bottom, in that culture they weren't. They were reasonably up, up there. They were that mid-range of artisans that had skills and abilities. But from the fishermen out there with the smell of stale fish on their fingers through to the clever builders and creators of good things like carpenters through to an academic like St Paul. This king has a motley crew that are not trained for killing, for marginalising, for hating, for wounding. This is a motley crew that are called to do something that, interestingly enough, anybody can do. You see, I'd be useless as a soldier because my legs are stuffed. 
Most 80 year olds wouldn't be much use in an army. They wouldn't have the vigour and physical ability to do it, huh? The beauty is that the army this king calls for can take the smallest child to the most incapable octogenarian because this is an army called to love and you can do that whether you're a tiny child. In fact, I'd almost go far as to say this little pest of a dog that hasn't behaved very well in church today. Uh, it's almost like nature itself knows how to love even beyond us. So that's the kind of king we have, not a king on a scooter, not a king on a Harley but on a scooter, not a king with a beautiful golden crown but a king with a crown of thorns, not a king that falls in with the traditions of left or right but has a third way that he calls humanity to live. This is the king who tells us what real kind of God there is in the universe. And it's not one that says God is great as it takes off the head of those that don't agree. This is a king who offers himself to public humiliation and crucifixion to show us the weakness of power and the power of what looks like weakness of grace and love. The second question is, if Christ is the king, if Christ the king is one we're going to remember this Christmas, what kind of kingdom? Well, the difficulty is that in this trial, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, the problem with that is that many of those who claim to be part of his army of love have missed the point. There are some who have politicised the gospel so much that just caring for the poor, just opposing rotten politicians, just seeking to chastise the rich for being too rich and not looking after the poor enough, the people who do all that stuff think that that's what it is, that the kingdom is just about welfare or political revolution or, or resistance. Because it says, my kingdom is not of this world, the other mob do the opposite. And they say, well, you know, until Jesus comes back, it's all going to be a mess. The Bible says it's going to be like that. So until the Lord comes back, really, we just want to get souls saved, be good, go to church, be religious, sing hymns, uh, not swear, don't get drunk, a whole bunch of things like that. And that's what it's about, because his kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. It's not of this world. Now, quite obviously, that's not right. When you too made that beautiful song, when Bono, I think he wrote the words of it, certainly in discussion with him, it would appear that he wrote the words. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It was based on what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount with that beautiful prayer when he said that we are to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is a kingdom that is not of the stuff of this distorted, hateful world. But it's not distinct from and irrelevant to this world. This is a king that wants his followers to actually be a demonstration of a kingdom that will totally change everything that is so destructive now. And it doesn't start when we die and go to heaven. And it doesn't start when Jesus comes back and rolls the whole of history up in a final statement of, of incredible transformation of the universe. No. It started way back in the heart of God when Father, Son and Holy Spirit conspired that one day they would come at the right time in history and that Jesus would come as the God-man and show us what the king is really like and show us what the kingdom of God should be like. This is a kingdom not of this world because if it was sourced by politics, I don't know how you feel. I don't think there's too many people that feel confidence in any political leaders to solve the problems at present. Do you? If it was of this world, we might as well pack it all up make a little circle, circle our wagons like in the old cowboy days, just protect our own from those 
savages out there kind of thing and just close ranks. If it's of this world, there's not much hope. But while it is the kingdom of heaven, it is a kingdom for this world. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One of the most beautiful pieces of literature I ever read and one of the most beautiful stories comes from a book I used way back in Truth and Liberation days in Bible teaching when we spent, I don't know, three months or whatever going through the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I picked up a book called The Prayer That Spans the World. I think it had several different names depending whether it was translated from the German into English in America or England or wherever. But one of the particular versions of the book uh, was called The Prayer That Spans the World. Now the man that wrote that was a man called Helmut Thielicke. And Helmut Thielicke was a great philosopher and a, uh, a tremendous Bible teacher and a great pastor. A uh, very outstanding man. I still love reading his stuff. If you want to bend your mind with great philosophy, then his books on theological ethics just have your mind spinning. But if you want to read beautiful stuff that just touches the heart, you pick up a book like The Waking Father, which is the story of the prodigal son and a whole bunch of other New Testament stories. And it's just so readable and beautiful. Well, he's one on the Lord's Prayer was like that. But this is the interesting thing. When he got to the section of the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was towards the end of the Second World War. Now, he was a German, and he was one of the few German pastors, uh, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that actually stood against Adolf Hitler. He was outspoken against Hitler. And he had a, a beautiful old church building that was a historic, wonderful building. And in between, thy kingdom come, one week, and the next week when he was to preach on the second part, on earth as it is in heaven, the Allied planes flew over and bombed his beautiful old historic church building to rubble. And he sat with his congregation that next week in the midst of just a heap of stones and rubble and, and broken cement and sat in the midst of that shattered church building and preached, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that beautiful? There's no wonder that some of the theologians like him and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and, and uh, uh, Karl Barth, uh, all those great theologians out of that German history, their theology and understanding of the kingdom and of the kingdom of God wonderfully was born in the midst of the horror of being Germans in opposition to their own country in the midst of the Second World War and the madness of Adolf Hitler. And they suffered as followers of Jesus from both sides. In his case, alienated from his own nation and his church building bombed to dust and rubble by the Allied forces. What kind of a kingdom is it? It's a kingdom of caring about this world it's a kingdom of defying this world while still caring for it. It is a clash of kingdoms. That's partly why today as these two groups gather together, they won't be talking the third way on either side of the protest marches today. This is a clashing kingdom a kingdom that clashes with the values of this world at every point. And the third thing to say is, this kingdom, what are the subjects of this kingdom to do? If Christ is the king, if his kingdom is not of this world, but it's a kingdom addressing this world and calling for it to be transformed, then what are his followers to do? Well, in the story, of course, his mates blew it every way. I mean, one of them that ended up being unfaithful anyway and 
being a coward and denying he even knew Jesus, first off, in the hot blood of the thing, he takes out a sword and chops off one of the enemy's ears. And in this kingdom, the followers of Jesus, no retaliation. Jesus took the ear in the story and healed the enemy's ear. That doesn't mean he approved of what the enemy was doing. But no doubt he probably would have shown the mercy being who he was. And when you see how much he said, I prefer mercy over judgment, he probably well understood that these guys maybe couldn't get a job anywhere else and being in the Roman army was the best hope. Like if you were black in the 1950s in the United States of America and you wanted to get a job and an education, your best chance was to go into the military. He would have understood that. And maybe when he healed that man's ear, there would have been something of a radical difference in attitude to the enemy, understanding why so many young men, whether Christian or Islamic, get involved in battles of violence that we shouldn't be involved in. Because that's what you've been taught. And that's what you're told is loyalty to your nation or your religion. And that's the only way you can get a good job and be guaranteed that you'll get an education for free when you come out of it. But his followers were not to retaliate. He didn't say, good on you, Pete, thanks for standing up for me. He certainly didn't approve of the traitor Judas, because he said of Judas, it's better that you were never born for what you've done. So it wasn't that he was saying it's all right to be a traitor, it's all right to let your mates down. He wasn't saying any of that. And what he was saying is, in my kingdom, my followers don't retaliate, they heal. In my kingdom, they don't cut ears off, they put them back on and heal them. And secondly, let me say that in the followers of this king, in this kingdom, it's not a revolution of the sort we understand in this world. Isn't it interesting, Art, the horrible way in which the power elite ran France before the French Revolution? To get rid of those rich kings and uppity people that used to mock the poor. You know, whether it is true that, uh, was it Antoinette, was it she that was supposed to have said, let them eat cake or something, for the poor that were starving on the streets? I think that might be mythological, we're not too sure about that, but that attitude was certainly there. And what happened when the rank and file had a revolution? They went out and knitted and sat there and cheered the old women as they watched the guillotine taking heads off. <laughs> you know, we get upset about beheading. We see the French Revolution as some sort of great revolution that brought democracy to France. But at what cost? You know, when we first started in the Jesus movement, we actually called it a Jesus revolution. And, and back then what we meant was that we were revolting against, we probably were revolting anyway, but we were revolting against the way the society was. I look back now and I don't know that we were wise in calling it the Jesus revolution. Maybe we should have called it the Jesus transformation. Because when you look at revolutions, in any country, those who've been oppressed when they take over so often behave like the oppressors they remove once they get power. No, his followers weren't to retaliate. And they weren't to start some kind of revolution of the sort we've seen in history where you simply do to the enemy what the enemy did to you. For Jesus had corrected the old Torah, the Jewish writings of the Old Testament. And my dear friends, I have not time to go into this today, but I am sick and tired of the ignorant academics and people I'm listening to on the radio. They're giving me the irrits. Because people keep on saying things like, well, there's no difference between the Quran and the New Testament, and Christians do it because of the teachings they've been given. One bloke was spouting on the other day on the ABC. You cannot find in the teachings of Jesus justification for violence against those you, you don't agree with. Because Jesus even challenged the Torah 
our Old Testament. He said it has been said, and he's quoting from the books of Moses, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which in those days was a much better and more just thing than a head for a tooth. So they were growing in their understanding of justice. But as God revealed bit by bit through human history, in the end we come to Jesus and he says, love your enemies. No, it's not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's not if Islam does this to us, we'll do that to them. It's not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's love your enemies, do good. Do good to those that do bad things to you. But finally, let me say, for the followers of this king, while there's no revolution and no retaliation, there's no concession either. This is not a kingdom of wimps that simply say, we'll be pacifists because it's nice to be pacifistic. There are plenty of people that are pacifist and godless. There are plenty of people that are non-violent, but selfish. It's not just a matter. I was not fighting back. This death of Jesus was not a weak pacifist thing. This was a strong statement of one who said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down and I will take it up again. Nobody's taking my life from me. I'm offering it to make a statement that God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him should have eternal life. So to be a follower of this king is not to concede the way the world is and just sit back and be nice and godly. This is still a resistance, though it may not be a revolution. And lastly, the question is asked in the trial of Jesus the King, what is the truth? You know, there's a quote from uh, the old saint for whom I have the absolute overwhelming respect uh, St. Francis and I need to go back and find the context of the statement they keep on making it's something like um, uh, preaching the gospel and if necessary using words something like that and people are quoting it on Facebook all the time well I think St. Francis if that's all he said and I've got to check out the context because when you take a sentence out of context you can do all sorts of things with it but if he said that he was wrong. It's nonsense. And I'm sick and tired of hearing that attitude from people about preaching. Because the Bible says, it has pleased God, in New Testament, not Old Testament, it has pleased God by the foolishness of preaching that men and women should believe. And you might remember the one time it's recorded when Jesus didn't go and heal people, when they're all lined up for healing, and his disciples said, they're all waiting for you, Jesus, to get healed. He said, no, I'm not going to have a healing line today, I'm going to go to the next town. Because he said, I'm going to the next town to preach the kingdom of God, for that is what I came to do. The primary work of Jesus was not his healings, though that was wonderful. The primary work of Jesus was to announce to us a living truth and to, to not only explain it, but to exhibit it in his own life. And the healings were the exhibition of the truth of who he was and of the love he said God has for us all. In this alternative kingdom, the truth, however, was not a bunch of ideas the truth was a person because John who records this question what is truth in frustration from the court chief he's also the one that tells us that Jesus said not let me tell you the truth what did he say I am the truth I am the way I am the truth I am the life and you know, in our Western thinking, we separate truth 